that chapter just kind of really shows you so much of Paul's writings do, his heart towards just the, the ministry, you know, and the mission to which we've been called. Yeah, I've got kind of a strange, you ever know anybody that's got a life first? Are you ever you familiar with that phrase, you know? Growing up, a lot of guys would tell, go to a preacher's meeting or something, and they'd have the, the pastor or the preacher there, maybe evangelist or something, sign their Bible. And, you know, some guys think it's kind of weird, and they'll be like, oh, I don't want to sign your Bible. That's weird. And others just sign it. A lot of times they'll sign it, and they'll put a Bible verse underneath it, and that's kind of like their life verse. I don't know if you're familiar with that. So growing up, I saw that a lot. And I never really had a life verse uh, that I would have called a life verse or whatever. But look over a couple uh, chapters over to 1 Corinthians 16, 15. In the last maybe five, six years, um, this is the one, if I was going to make something my life first, it would be this. Chapter 16, verse 15. Seems like a weird verse to claim as your life first, but it says, I beseech you, brethren, it's all, every, my, you know, everything is in these parentheses now. You know the house of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. And I think about Paul, and that's one thing for sure. He was addicted he addicted himself. It was night and day. Like, this is what I want to do, man. This, I just want to serve the Lord. I want to be about the work. And, uh, and it's easy to get derailed. It's easy to get sidetracked and start thinking about the things of the world and thinking about different things. But you got to addict yourself. You know, I'm going to go back to this illustration. You know, I can get addicted to exercise and running. That's my personality type. I can get addicted to just about anything. Coffee, you name it. <laughs> I'm glad I never had a desire to taste alcohol. Amen. Because uh, I have one of those addictive type personalities, and and uh, and you know, to start a running program or an exercise program, you don't just naturally get addicted to that. It takes a little bit of work. You got a purpose to do it, and then eventually, after you've made yourself do it a few times, you're just like, man, I gotta wait. You wake up and you're just, I just gotta go do it. You know, it's time to go knock doors. I gotta go do it. But it takes a little bit of work to to make yourself want to do that and to, and to preach and to study your Bible and to do all those things. So I want to preach this message tonight called The Mission. I think I'm going to do some preaching. Some of it is just going to be uh, just sharing my heart and talking. You know, I'm still sticking with this thing I've been doing on Sunday mornings, talking about just the local church and kind of my vision, expectations, policies, that kind of stuff. And this is going to be more about uh, what we call missions, Right, most churches have a missions program or whatever, but different perspective. You'll understand by the end of the message. But it's just the mission. Okay, the mission it was a while back. Uh, I heard a guy pre preaching at a missions conference, and I remember his message. His, when he was preaching the message, it was on this same subject, saying there's not really missions. Not like you have a mission and they have a mission and they have a mission. We all have the same mission, right? And so, uh, and it really just kind of resonated in my mind, and I and I got to thinking about how true that is. And let me just give you a background, a little background. I felt like I was called to preach at a young age, eight, maybe nine, and I felt like, uh, you know, that's what the Lord was going to use me to do is to preach. And I had my ups and downs, you know, into my teenage years and all that, but I felt this desire to preach, and uh, you know, I did. I, I didn't know a whole lot about soul winning. I did invite people to church. I did talk to some of my friends. Even got a few friends saved at a fairly young age, and uh, and I had this desire to do that. But in my mind, I always had to do something big. You know, I played on the baseball team, and it's like of all the positions you can play, I wanted to be the pitcher, right? Because that's where all the action was. And, uh, and, and, you know, soccer, I wanted to either be like the goalkeeper or something, you know, because that's where all the action was. And so it's normal for a kid to just fantasize and think big, right? And so it's natural probably that by the time I got serious about this in my teenage years, I was like, okay, I've been saying my whole, most of my life that I'm going to be a preacher. And the Lord allowed some things, some circumstances to happen in my life where I was reminded of that call. And I said, I'm going to give my life to go preach and uh, one day it was actually at a missions conference again we had a missions conference at our church or at least a missionary came in on Wednesday night or something like that he began to share his burden for for his field I remember it was Argentina I remember what the guy looks like 
I don't really remember his message except for I remember this because it's kind of like uh, uh, ironic, but his message was this. You know, you send all these missionaries across the world and they go all the way over, you know, to other parts of the world and, uh, and, they, and they give the gospel to people, see souls saved. But are you, you know, making this your mission field? Are you knocking on the doors of your neighbors across the street and all that? And I remember th- th- it's ironic because that was in my head and I was thinking, that's right, that's right, man. I just got to see this as a mission field. I got to give the gospel to people. And that night at work, I worked a night shift at UPS. And when I came in that night, there was this guy from Africa, and he was coming in. Uh, it was a strange situation. I felt like it was one of those entertaining angels un- unawares situations, <laughs> okay? But he was, Af- he, he was from Africa, and w- I, we began to talk as we were walking in the building. And out of the blue, this was really weird, okay? I don't know why I did it, but I just said, you know, I'm thinking about being a missionary in Africa. And he was like, well, let me tell you all about my country. And we met like the following Saturday, and he, and he told me about his country. And I said, that's it, man. I'm going to be a missionary in the Gambia, West Africa. Well, you guys know I'm standing right here, so I never made it to the Gambia, right? I have led a few Africans to the Lord, though. Praise the Lord for that. But I uh, uh, didn't, didn't ever make it there. I went off to Bible college and all that. But let, let me explain something. I grew up uh, independent Baptist, you know, from the time I was saved. Independent Fundamental Baptist, all the churches we were in were that way. And, you know, we're in its time, I think, in the Independent Fundamental Baptist movement where there's, there's divisions, you know, there's something like there's a, there's, a, there's a huge push right now. Like you're either going to go one way, you're going to go contemporary, you know, you're going to go another way and start being this wacko, like preaching all this weird stuff, hyper dispensationalism, something like that, you know, or you're going to stick with the old paths, right? But you're going to have to do some things new because the old paths guys, they're all in their 80s now, you know, they're, they're, there's got to be somebody coming up on the scene. And guess what? All these guys that have been faithful for many years, preaching hard, preaching the truth, their kids are going to the contemporary crowd. You know, and so there's there's a group of people who are independent, fundamental. They love the old path. They love the old preaching. They love a lot of those old ways. But they say, but somebody's going to have to say, wait, we got to do some things a little bit different. Right. Because some things aren't working anymore. Maybe they were broken from the very beginning. Some of these. Right. And so here's how missions worked from the time I was a kid. Many years before me, I understand that, like 1900s, a lot of this uh, came into play uh, where there was this push for getting people to surrender to the mission field. Getting people, if they didn't surrender, it was like this. You either give or you go, right? You either go to the mission field because there are people out there in the obscure places of this world who are dying, going to hell. Somebody's got to go reach them. Or else you give money so that other people can go to those places and they can. You, are you familiar with that mentality at all? And so, uh, you know, and, and, and here's the thing. A kid, what am I talking about, kid? Even today, I love adventure stories. I love to see a missionary come and show pictures of the foreign field that they go to and the needy people and the huts and the conditions they're living in and the tears and the bugs flying around and you just get a heart for them and say, ah, somebody's got to go give them the gospel, right? And you know that you can't go most of the time. You know, 99% of us aren't going to be able to go, probably more than that, or a higher percentage than that. You know you're not going to be able to go, but man, every mission's presentation where they showed the slides, they showed the videos, and the, and the heart-wrenching song in the background. And every time I'm like, maybe God will have me go to that field. Maybe he'll have me go to that field, you know. And then when I had thought I was going to go to Africa, it was just constantly. Even though every missionary was telling me, man, we need missionaries on that field because everybody comes back home. It's so hard. They're all Muslims and nobody's getting saved in, in Gambia, right? Nobody's getting saved. Somebody's got to go over there. And my heart was really burdened for them. But in the back of my mind... I remember also thinking, well, why do I want to go there if I'm going to dedicate the rest of my life and see no fruit, you know, uh, no, you know, have this, put my family through all that, be unreceptive to the gospel. Now, now, yes, there's that chance 
And please, I'm going to make a disclaimer here in a minute. But there's that chance, yes. God put me down that field. One person got saved in my entire life. And it's a wonderful story. One soul got saved. Wouldn't that be great? Praise the Lord. But what if I could have reached hundreds of souls in that same amount of time? Right? And in my mind, I started thinking, ah, just something's just not right. And I remember the burden kind of going away. And I started thinking, maybe God just kind of like, said, let's put them on hold. They're not receiving the gospel out there, you know. And so now I've got something else for you to do. And I remember wrestling with that feeling of being sad, like I was letting down the Gambian people, you know, letting down West Africa. And, uh, and still today, when I see a slide of African people, when we go down to uh, Little Congo, you know, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's touching, right, because I'm thinking, Am I letting these people down? Am I, was I supposed to go there? <clears throat> so let me make my disclaimer real quick. Uh, I do not like to put down people in the old IFB. Like, I don't like to just go railing on how silly they are, how crazy they look. I might get in the flesh from time to time, yes, and do that. <laughs> but for the most part, like, I know some really good people their entire life, they've loved the Lord, they wanted to reach souls. I might not agree with the method of everything that they've done, or maybe there was a time when it worked and now it doesn't. And I look at, I mean, in Iola, we support a lot of missionaries. You've probably seen the pictures up on the wall. And we only give like, we only send like 40 bucks a month to each of those missionaries. That's not very much. But we got a burden and a, and a desire to do something. And for years and years and years, this church has sent money. Just here, yeah, sure. We want to preach. The, we want to see the gospel spread. You know, we want those missionaries out there to have the money that they need to build their churches and to do all this kind of stuff. And uh, and to be honest with you, I love these missionaries. Okay, some of them have spent their entire life there. They've seen a lot of souls saved. They've worked really hard. I wouldn't want to belittle the work that they've done. I certainly wouldn't want to harm them or. All of a sudden, like take away all the money, you know, that, they're, that they've been living off of their whole life and now they have to come back, you know. Does that make sense? Like I don't, it's not my desire to hurt anybody, to talk bad about them. I love a lot of them. We've got faithful people in our church who have been giving their tithes and offerings and above that, giving to missionaries. Amounts of money that would probably st startle, uh, not startle, but surprise you, shock you if you saw how much they're giving, right? Why? Because they want these missionaries, you know, to be able to continue to work in the fields that they are. But I'm going to be honest with you. I get letters from these missionaries. And you're hard-pressed to find anything where they're really doing a great work winning souls for the Lord, right? It's all about just setting up their houses and living and, hey, we've been in language school for 20 years, you know. And, uh, and a lot of times you're not seeing anything getting done and you're like, I hope more is getting done than that. And we're just not getting the message for some reason or something, you know, but you see these, uh, and sometimes not all of them, you know, we just got one missionary. We can help these people and then we can, you know, maybe somewhere down the road, they're going to see that and, and they're going to like us and we can preach the gospel to them. I mean, it's that kind of a stuff. And I'm thinking, ah, oh, what is going on with missions, right? The way I remember missions, people sacrificed and they went to the field and they didn't even know how they were going to make it through the next month. And I'm not saying everybody has to live in that condition. I'm just saying that's what they did. And then they knocked on doors. They preached the gospel. They started churches. They worked and worked and worked, you know. And uh, now it just seems like we've come to a welfare mentality, you know. And let me explain it real quick because I got a lot to say and I, and I haven't even started. <laughs> so... Uh, I like the stories, okay? I like the, the thought of these guys that gave their life. And I remember reading when I was, thought I was going to be a missionary, I remember reading about Hudson Taylor, first book somebody gave me. He said, okay, well, you're thinking about going to Bible college and being a preacher? Here, read this book. I read Through the Gates of Splinter, the story about uh, uh, Jim Elliott and how they flew into the Alka Indians. And basically these were like cannibals and they didn't, want, they didn't like people. And so these guys ended up dying, right? Years later, somebody came back and reached them, and the ministry continues on. And Jim Elliott said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. I love that, man. It fires you up. Great story. Someone gave their lives, 
you know, for the cause of Christ. And, and uh, who knows by what their sacrifice didn't inspire other people and, and people got saved as a result of that. I love that. I love that. But here's what happened over the years with missions. Okay, I'm not going to say when it happened or where it's happened or whose fault it is or anything like that. But over the years, what happened with missions is there became this big push to just give, 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 give till it hurts. And when it hurts, give some more. Okay. And so there was this push growing up that was called faith promise giving. Everybody familiar with faith promise? Okay. So I don't have to spend too much time on that. But in short, the idea was you come up with the figure, you pray about it. You come up with a figure and it should be a figure that's going to hurt you. Like you don't know how you're going to be able to give that much next month or next week or whatever, week to week basis. You pray about that. God will give you a figure and then you make a pledge, right? A vow. What's James say about vow? James 5, 12. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any, uh, any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. And I remember even growing up and even into married life, the cards would come around. All right, it's faith promise time. You know, we got to get your commitments in because here was the goal that each year you'd raise that and the church would say, hey, look how much we're giving to missions, right? Next year, it's got to be more. Next year, it's got to be more than that. And so you felt pressured, really, to up that amount. And I remember telling my wife many times, like, I can't do that. Like, I want to give. And I still give to this day to missions uh, because, of, because of the, probably because this was ingrained in me, for one thing. But I remember saying, I'm not going to fill out the car. Sometimes I would. And then the whole year, you're thinking, man, I got to put that commitment. But, uh, but most of the time, I, I, would, I just don't feel right about that. I'm making a promise, and then what if something happens? I'm not able to keep that promise. I feel like I'm testing God, like, like in a bad way, you know, tempting the Lord. And I had a little bit of problem with that. But here's a couple verses that they'll use saying, you know, hey, we need to give more. We need to give more. And I, and I don't want to get, I don't want to preach too long tonight, but look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm just start reading 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we should receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first they gave them their own selves to the Lord, and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus, that uh, as he had begun, so, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. So anyway, you see there this idea about their deep poverty, and how they gave themselves and all that stuff. And he just really brought that stuff out. I remember even whenever I was just first going to Bible college and you wanted every opportunity to preach that you could. And somebody said, hey, well, we're having a missions conference. Why don't you teach the Sunday school class and teach on faith promise? And I remember uh, I was at BBC at the time and I went to their library and there was all these books on faith promise. And you opened it up because BBFI had sent out a lot of missionaries. And uh, you open up the books and it basically taught you how to preach on faith promise giving. And I'm not kidding, man. The idea was, man, you've got to make these people realize they've got to give everything for the missions. But what that meant was give every last dime. <laughs> Give all your money to the missionaries, okay? Now, I'm not saying that it was bad and that the Lord wouldn't bless those people that did that. And I'm not saying it's bad that we give money to these missionaries who are doing that stuff. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is there is some danger that came from this, and I believe we see it today, number one, and what's going on with, the, with the, uh, the lack of fire in some of these missionaries, okay? But not only that... You know, it sounds dangerously close to the charismatic word of, uh, word of faith uh, ministry. You know what that is? Word of faith. Basically, you think of all these guys, uh, help me out here, Joel Osteen. Uh, what's the guy's name? He looks like a demon. 
<laughs> I don't want to make fun of him because he's a big heretic, man. <laughs> what? I mean, it's like, he looks like a demon. What's his name? Somebody help me, huh? Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Copeland man. That guy is, is hard to look at. So, <laughs> these guys are part of this, this word of faith ministry. You think of faith healing and faith this and that. And I'm not kidding. I get so mad. I watch them, and they are talking about this seed, you know, the more you want to grow, the more seed you plant. And so they say, if you just send a seed offering, right? What if your kid has cancer? Boy, you really better send a big seed, right? And so these people will give every last dime, hoping that God's going to send them more blessings because they're giving more money. And I see the faith promise, and I'm like, that sounds dangerously close to the word of faith type of mentality. Yeah. And I don't want to test God, tempt God, and I don't want to try to, I certainly as a pastor don't want to try to persuade people that don't have money to give to the point that they're hurting, hoping that God's going to bless them in a, in a special way because they gave their last dime, right? And I'm going to say more about that in a minute. But I think that's very dangerous uh, mentality to have. And you see it in the charismatic church. Uh, which really goes real close with some of these early days of sacrificing and giving everything you can to go to the mission field and stuff. All right, number two, this cause, this push for faith promise and missions giving, uh, it caused people to think that this is the only method, the only way that we can, we can reach people around the world. Okay, And so here's how the program goes. This is the stereotypical IFB way of uh, doing evangelism worldwide, okay? Missions. Number one, they got to go to school. That's what I thought. That's what I was told. Got to go to school. At least four years. If you're super smart and you and somebody pays your way, I guess you don't have to work or something. Maybe you can get it done in three and a half. But I'm probably going to develop, probably going to give four, pers I mean, four years. And there's a lot of good stuff that can happen during that four years. A lot of training, a lot of dedication, learning learning how to uh, sacrifice, right? Because you're, you're working full-time job and going to school and you're having to pay the bills and raise a family. There's a lot of good stuff that comes from that. But they go four years, they're working hard, they're doing all that stuff. They're finally done with school. Now what's the next step? They got to raise support because it costs a lot of money to go to another country and to live and, and to do all those kinds of things. So they got to raise support. So now at least two years, I think if you got done raising your support in two years, that's pretty much like uh, better than the normal for sure. It's probably closer to four years or something like that. I don't know. But let's say two years, your full-time job is to raise support. So how do you do that? Well, maybe you have a church that sends you, right? And they, and they say, uh, you know, here, I'll write out some recommendations, send letters to all these churches, help you get some, some meetings scheduled and we'll back you up, we'll help you with some money to get started. And then you're pretty much gonna live off of love offerings. Every time you go to one of those churches, you know, you're hoping that they're gonna take care of you. Now, as a pastor and as a church member, love for the Lord, love, of, love for the ministry, love for these missionaries and the work that they're doing, when they come through, man, you really wanna give. On top of your faith promise missions, you're like, I, I, I can't let these guys they're on full-time deputation, man. That's hard work. And you're like, I got to give. I got to give. I got to give. Now, let me tell you, some of these times that these guys are on deputation, it's, it's hard work. Homeschooling in the car, traveling all across the world. Sometimes maybe they're not, it's not as glamorous as they expected. Other times, I guarantee you this, some people love it. Some people love it. I'm a world traveler. I get to go to all these high energetic preaching uh, seminars and be a part of them and I can preach my same two three messages every church I go to and uh, people are pouring out their love for me buying me suits taking me out to dinner uh, I'm kind of like a celebrity some people enjoy this time of deputation don't make make no mistake about it now I'm not saying I mean it's their job right it's their full-time job but who's paying for it all those people in the churches Right, that are sac already probably sacrificially given to faith promise and tithes and offerings, and now they're given above and beyond, and they think that they're doing their work in evangelism by putting money in the plate so this guy can have a new suit and he can go around knocking on, on church doors and asking for money. And trust me, I get calls all week long 
hey, I'm going to the field of such and such. I wonder if I can come present my ministry. And, I, and it hurts me to ignore the call or to call them and say, hey, look, I'm just not interested at this time. It hurts me because I've been ingrained that we need to help our missionaries. Don't you dare leave a missionary out there without support. Don't you dare. You do everything you can to take care of them, and you start feeling like you got to. That's the program. How else are they going to do what God called them to do? Because they'll stand up there and say, God called me to the field. I've got to get there. I know that feeling because I remember saying, God called me to Gambia, West Africa. And I know I'm not saying, again, that they're lying or that they're trying to get filthy lucre. You know, I'm sure there's some of them like that. But I think for the most part, they just feel like this is the way I got to do it. Sometimes it works out in their benefit. Sometimes they don't like it. And all the people in the pews, they've been taught you've got to sacrificially give. you got to, hey, if you buy yourself, you know, a drink from the gas station, shame on you. That money could have went to missions. And I mean, there's this kind of guilting that goes on to you. I'm not kidding. And so people feel like they got to be part of the program. So they finish school. They raise support for two years or four years or whatever, going from church to church, a full-time deputation, hoping that they can raise the money that they set. This is how much money I need typically to be comfortable, let's be honest. And they'll say, well, I got wife and kids. I got to take care of them. So if I go to the I got to make sure I got plenty of money coming in and we need this and that. So it's usually a pretty comfortable amount that comes in. All right. Again, please understand my heart. I'm not just trying to down people and make fun of them or, or, or criticize everything above and beyond. I understand it. I understand where they're coming from, and I don't think all their hearts are just wicked because they're, they're caught up in this program, but I think there's a, there's a lot to be, uh, uh, to be had, you know, thinking up of another way. So here's what happens after they finally raise support. They have to go to the mission field, and guess what? They don't even know the language. <laughs> They've got to go to the mission field. Now they can't speak the language. They're going to spend the next two, four. I'm not kidding. I know guys that have been on the field for 20 years and still don't speak the language. I'm not saying they don't see any souls saved through interpreters or whatever they got going, working with a, another pastor there or something like that. But I'm telling you, all those years that they're there in language school, all those years that they're doing whatever it is, you know, and if and I'm, I'm not being ugly, if their car breaks down, they send letters to all their supporting churches saying, man, we need a new car. And maybe somebody will send me some money and get a new car, right? And their full-time job is learning the language, right? They could have done that here. <laughs> now, people say, no, you can't do that. Well, I'll say this for sure. Nowadays, you can. Right. Nowadays, you can. There's no excuse nowadays. You can get online. There, every country, every language... You can get online and find somebody who will chat with you, help teach you the language. It's possible. I can't think of any language. I mean, maybe some real obscure third world country language, but that's another matter. So anyway, all these years and all this money from the members of the church have gone into this program and gone into this life. And these people have gone through all this and, uh, and they finally, you know, learn the language What's their next step? Well, we've got to buy a building. We've been looking around. The Lord gave us this, this perfect, ideal location. It's in a good spot. And if you really think about it, a lot of times they don't hardly have any converts. All they got now is a possible building. And they're sending money to all their supporting churches saying, hey, you need to help us get this building. You know, Where are we going to meet if we don't have this building? So you send them the money. You say, well, man, they've got to have a building. And you're just pouring all this money to it. Now they've got a building. Now you got a building. Now you got to fill that building with people. So what are you going to do? Well, we got to find some events and some very some some exciting programs and some stuff to get the kids in and some some uh, just all these things. I've heard all these in their motivation. I'm not saying their motivation is evil. Okay, I think they think that this is the way we got to do it. And then they try and then they send letters. Hey, we did these programs, and you send pic you get pictures back from the program. Oh, fancy man, the way they decorated and all the stuff they did. Handful of people in there, which is okay. I understand that, but you you're looking at the letters, thinking how many souls are getting saved, and they're saying, keep praying, keep praying. Last month I had an opportunity to witness to somebody. I've been working on them, you know, all this time, and they finally opened up the opened up a little bit and asked me about spiritual things. And I was able, and you're thinking, you've been there for how long? 
and you're just now talking about spiritual things? <laughs> and all that money's gone into this. Now, I can't pinpoint everyone that's doing this and who's doing what. You know, I understand. You know, that's, that's a tough job. Who's going to be the one that calls someone out and says, you're not doing anything? What, uh, do I have to go visit each of our missionaries and follow them around and, and watch what they're doing? <laughs> you know? And then if you do that, you get criticized big time. How dare you ask these missionaries, making their life harder, trying to find out if they preach the gospel right, and you're like, that's pretty important. <laughs> How dare you like, limit them in their uh, abilities to be able to do this God-called you know, mission. <clears throat> so you can see where I feel like the, the system is broken, man. There's got to be another possibility out there, especially 2020. There's got to be another way to do it. <laughs> All right. So let me give you just a couple of things here. Uh, here are a possibility. And everybody, I think probably that I'm talking to is on the same page on this. So, so, but here's the thing. Number one, you start winning souls wherever you are. And your local church start winning souls. You know, I know people that went to Bible college, got all the training, went on deputation, probably don't even know how to win a soul to the Lord. You know, I'm at, I, that sounds very critical. Like, how do you know that? Look, I know it. <laughs> I know it. People that don't know how to win a soul, and they just say, well, you know, I'm, I'm building friendships, right? They're watching me, and eventually they're going to come listen to me preach, and then I'll preach the gospel, right? And that's just not the way the church is supposed to work, okay? So what we can start doing is everybody preach the gospel now, <laughs> wherever you are, in the language that you understand, in the tongue that God gave you to speak with, okay? And then if you're interested in reaching people of other languages, learn the language now while you're still working and making a living for yourself, right? Not asking other people to pay your way through language school, but you learn the language. And, and I have a desire, as many of you have expressed here too, to learn Spanish, like to really like get conversational, like ASAP, because we knock on doors and how many times have you had to say, oh, I'm sorry, I guess we can't communicate. <laughs> Let me give you this card or something or look at this video because I don't know how to communicate with you. Right here in Kansas City, big Spanish population, we should learn, somebody needs to learn how to speak Spanish or, or several of us. You know, I think if we learn Spanish, we could go on a lot of missions trips and go knocking doors in other countries and see people saved. And so I think that I, I wish, you know, I had a huge desire when we when we landed upon little Congo to learn Swahili. Swahili is an easy language to learn from what I understand. And I was like, man, what if I could learn Swahili just enough to give somebody the gospel in Swahili you know, or something? There's got to be a way to learn. So look, but guess what? You can learn that. You know, on your way back and forth to work every day. You know, you put in your headphones. There's programs out there. Uh, there's YouTube. There's so many different ways you can learn languages. And we can do that now. I like this idea of going on missions trips. You know, I got a I got a friend up in uh, in Zambia, Africa. Uh, he's part of more like you know what we would call the old IFB. Uh, but he said, man, you guys come out here anytime. And, you know, you unlimited, man, they'll listen to you. They'll listen to you preach the gospel. Nobody's going to stop you. You could just do that all day long. And I'm like, hey, man, let's go do it. <laughs> I'm not going to be kicked out of the country. <laughs> <clears throat> so I like the idea of taking trips. But guess what? That's your vacation time. <laughs> I know that's a sacrifice, okay? But sacrificing a vacation time to go take a missions trip, you know, is a lot less commitment than sacrificing everything to go across the world, right? So I think that's a great step that you could be doing now, you know, sort of now, while you're still working and while you're doing all these things. <clears throat> but the point is this. We need to reset our current program when it comes to mission work, okay? We need to reset on that. We need to rethink about it. In Independent Fundamental Baptist, we need to say, well, the system's broken. It's kind of become a welfare mentality. And in the end of the day, it doesn't seem like a lot of people are even putting in the work that they should be putting in. And, I, and I, that sounds so critical and so heartless. And I was raised to, like, you know, you wash your mouth out with soap if you criticize the missionaries. <laughs> but that's really I, I, what I see, okay? 
Here is, there's not missions. Here is the mission. Are you ready? Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And it's say, you know, invite every buddy who's willing to preach the gospel in so that you can give them a love offering and send them over to another country to go to language school and all that kind of stuff. He said, no, ye, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Matthew 28, 19, 20, go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. This was the, the mission that Christ left the church with and uh, left his church with. And so you see that, you follow through the book of Acts. We've got some pretty good examples of how to do this, okay? Really, if we did it like Paul did it, it really wouldn't look like this missions program that I just spelled out, okay? <clears throat> and by the way, everything I just said applies not only to foreign missions, but applies to home missions, okay? People doing the exact same thing that I just described to you in America, in the United States, let me go raise money for four years, you know, full-time deputation as a missionary living in the United States. Once they raise that money, let me go buy a building, let me have a program, and they're, you know, it, it, it's sad. Now, some of them work another job on the side or whatever, but I'm telling you, this is messed up, right? They're not even doing the soul winning. They're not even knocking doors. They're not even, you know, it's all about give me the money, and then we'll make something happen, all right? And nothing usually really happens <laughs> as far as evangelism goes. The, the, the commission, the mission is go ye therefore and preach the gospel. Okay, so here's my vision. <clears throat> Honestly, I don't think we're ready to even worry about foreign missions. <laughs> like anybody here need to, you know, raise some money to go on a trip. <laughs> you know, that's... That's different, but we're not in a situation as a church to even worry about that. Now, I want to make this distinction. I want to be clear about this because some people might be confused on it. In Iola, we still have the, the original missions program. You say, wait a minute, it's broken. Shut it down. Well, here's the deal. Okay, Here's my conviction about this. I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to put anybody out who might be sincere. They've been living off of this program for all this, all this time. Here's the deal. Our mission's focus here is on local evangelism. Okay? Our desire, and this is the biblical model, you know, read the book of Acts. Our desire here is to turn Kansas City upside down. Right? My desire in Iola is to turn Iola upside down. Every area surrounding Iola, we want to hit that. Every area surrounding Kansas City, we want to hit that. Brother Justin's talked already about Wellsville, where he lives. You know, here's an interesting thing for you. Barnabas and, and Paul, right, were commissioned by the church. You know what? We're going to send you to go minister to the Gentiles. Do you know where the first place they went was? It was a little island called Cyprus, right? If you read in the Bible when it first introduces Barnabas, it says he was from Cyprus. First place they went on their missionary journey was to Barnabas' hometown. <laughs> you think he knew some people around that area? He had some family, some friends, and all that. You know, there was a plan, I think. There was a system. Now, I realize the Macedonian call, right? Paul had a vision, guy in Macedonia saying, hey, come preach us the gospel. And so he said, hey, we've got to head there. And so he worked his way over there. The Lord does guide us and direct us sometimes to some weird places we never thought he would. I mean, how did I end up in Kansas City, right? So we allowed for the fact that the Lord will direct us in different places. But you do what makes sense. You say, I'm going to start with my friends and my family. You know, we could go out and get a lot of people saved, and we, we need to keep doing that. But when you get a family member saved, you know what? They're more likely to come to church with you. They're more likely to begin to be discipled after that. You know, you get strangers in their doors and they're like, well, you know, I'm glad that guy led me to the Lord. But those are a bunch of nuts out there. All they want to do is be hyper soul winners. <laughs> right. And they like hard preaching and stuff like that. And they like preaching against sin. Man, I still kind of like my sin. <gasps> yeah, they can be saved and still like sin. <laughs> so it makes sense. Just hit where you are like crazy while you're learning. 
You want to learn another language? Fine, learn another language. You want to learn the Bible? You want to learn how to be a preacher? You want to learn all those things? You can do that without going to Bible college. You can do that without four years right, of, of going to another place. You can do that right here, and I believe that is uh, the ministry. Keep turning this place upside down. Uh, we, can, uh, we can utilize, like never before, social media. We can utilize the Internet. We can, inter we can reach a lot of people in the world in ways that missionaries were never able to, to reach them. You know, I'm supposed to be hosting uh, one of the soul winning events for the soul winning mega marathon. I'm supposed to be uh, hosting somebody in the Caribbean. I have no idea how this is going to take place. My first thought is, I guess I got to go there and talk to somebody. I mean, suffering for Jesus in the Caribbean. <laughs> but then I thought, I don't have to go there. Sure, there's some soul winners there that can do it. We can talk over, over you know, uh, FaceTime or something like that, you know. So we're in a time in our society. Technology is amazing. Like never before, we can reach people in ways uh, that they couldn't do back then. And so this whole system, this whole mentality has to be turned upside down. But here's the main thing to remember. We can't think. What about the missionaries? What are we going to do about the missionaries? Who are we going to, how are they going to get their money? How are they going to do it? We are the missionaries. We are the missionaries, right? And so that's what every church ought to be doing. Glo think globally, sure. We want to reach the world. Go ye into all the world. But we do it by, first of all, everybody in here is involved somehow in doing locally and then, Lord willing, he'll move us on to other places. Look again to 1 Corinthians 9, chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse uh, 15. I'll just read a section of this. I know Brother Justin already read it. Just look at the heart of the Apostle Paul for some motivation here. 1 Corinthians 9, 15. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written... Uh, these things that it should be so done unto me for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void for though I preach the gospel I have nothing to glory of I'm not a hero or some you know some famous person for preaching the gospel what do I have to glory of for necessity is laid upon me yea woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel You don't need to pay me to do it. <laughs> you don't need to pay me to start a church. You don't need to pay me to preach the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge. For I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, as without the law, being not without the law to God, but under uh, the law to Christ, that I might gain them that were without the law. To the weak I became... I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. It doesn't say, you know, I went over to the other uttermost parts of the world to spend 20 years and not save anybody. <laughs> He's doing everything he can to save as many people as he can, right? And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore run, not as uncertainty, so fight I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. You want something to addict yourself to, addict yourself to the ministry. Addict yourself to giving the gospel 
addict yourself to seeing souls saved and carrying out the mission because you are the missionaries. Let's pray. Father, thank you.